The final farewell to the UK's longest reigning monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, laid to rest as the world watched. The extraordinary funeral mirrored her 70 years of service, focused on dignity and duty. King Charles and the royal family right by the Queen's side. The new king leaving a handwritten note to his mother on her coffin. Our Kira Phillips takes us inside the moving memorial. Catastrophic damage in Puerto Rico, where a deadly storm dumped 35 inches of rain in some areas, knocking out power to the entire island. Hundreds of people in desperate need of rescue as flood waters rise. What happens now that a crucial grid is offline? New nuclear concerns in Ukraine. Russian missiles reportedly hit just hundreds of feet away from another power plant, this time the second largest plant in the country. Tonight, the forceful response from President Zelensky. Suffering and starvation, the deep and painful famine in three African countries is now past a critical level. Our Matt Gutman flew to Somalia, the epicenter of the crisis where children are going hungry, and UN agencies say they simply don't have the money to help all of those in need. For me, the declaration of famine is irrelevant. Because right now, look, look around you. What is this if this is not famine? His case captured the nation's attention. The man at the center of the legal saga that inspired the hit podcast Serial has had his conviction overturned. How after 23 years behind bars, accused in the murder of a teenage girl, he is now a free man. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with Hurricane Fiona's wrath and the catastrophic impacts the storm is having on already battered communities in Puerto Rico. Flooding, mudslides, power outages, and water rescues. And tonight, Fiona is pounding the Dominican Republic. The devastating storm knocking out Puerto Rico's power grid. And when all is said and done, it may dump roughly 30 inches of rain on some parts of the island. First responders so far have helped rescue roughly 1,000 residents who were trapped. Water rose so quickly, the surge buckled this bridge and then completely washed it away. Scientists say human-induced climate change is supercharging these types of storms. And tonight there is widespread flooding across the island and flash flood warnings remain in effect. Rob Marciano is standing by with the latest track and we are set to talk with FEMA's administrator about the active first response and recovery effort. But first, ABC's Victor Akendo leads us off from Puerto Rico. Tonight, Hurricane Fiona pummeling the Dominican Republic making its second landfall as a Category 1 hurricane, as communities across Puerto Rico are inundated with devastating floodwaters. Fiona making its first landfall in the U.S. territory Sunday, winds gusting over 100 miles an hour, ripping off roofs. In the mountain town of Utuado, a torrent of flood water tearing apart this bridge and sweeping it away. It's now been more than 24 hours since Hurricane Fiona made landfall, and the rain just hasn't let up. Some areas could see up to 30 inches of rain. Fiona coming nearly five years to the day since Category 4 Maria. Here in Salinas, Luis Cruz says his home of 36 years, now a total loss. Was it this bad? Was the flooding like this during no, Hurricane no, Maria? Never. No, 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 yeah. This is worse now. Oh, yeah. Climate change supercharging the amount of rain hurricanes now bring. Los daños a la infraestructura. Puerto Rico's governor calling the damage catastrophic. The National Guard and first responders rescuing more than a thousand people. Ruben Ramos and his mother Onelia waiting seven hours to be saved. Uh -huh. The water, she says that the water was running just like this, but inside of her house. Nearly the entire island without electricity and hundreds of thousands have no running water. Water issues now on top of the power outages. Victor Akendo joins us now from Puerto Rico. And Victor, uh, we know Puerto Rico's power grid never fully recovered after Maria. What are officials telling you tonight as far as when power will likely be restored? Lindsay, the private company that operates the power grid here in Puerto Rico says it could take several days to restore power to the entire island, but every resident that I've spoken with here believes it will take longer than that. And unfortunately, there is more heavy rain on the way tonight. Lindsay. All right, Victor Kendo for us. Thanks so much, Victor. Joining us now for more on Puerto Rico's ongoing power struggles is FEMA Administrator Deanne Criswell. Uh, Deanne, thank you so much for joining us. Hurricanes, of course, regularly hit the island nation, and there are concerns that they will only get worse with climate change. Would you say that, that FEMA adequately was prepared for this? 
Uh, Lindsay, thanks so much for having me on today. Uh, FEMA is definitely prepared to support the hurricane that we're seeing right now in Puerto Rico from Hurricane Fiona or any other natural disaster that might strike the U.S. But as you said, we're seeing an increase in the number of these types of events across the country, these significant rain events that we saw earlier this year, uh, flash flooding records that are breaking records that have been set hundreds of years before. Um, we are postured and we are ready to support these, but we have to focus on what we can do to start to reduce the impacts that these communities are seeing from these types of events so we don't have to respond as much and we can increase their resilience. And what are you seeing as the biggest needs right now in Puerto Rico? The focus right now as the storm has passed is always right life safety at first. We want to make sure that we have the right resources in place to support any life saving activities that need to happen and then power restoration. We want to make sure that we can get that power restored as quickly as we can or temporary power put in place as we're restoring it. Those two things really support the rest of the recovery efforts. And you just mentioned that power restoration. Of course, we see issues with power grids uh, here on the mainland, whether it's in Texas or California or parts of the Midwest. West. Yet those grids seem to come back up within days. Why is Puerto Rico's power situation still so unreliable five years after Maria? You know, what we see after any type of a major hurricane like we're seeing now is our power grid does go down. You know, we saw the power go out in Louisiana last year after Hurricane Ida, and it was out for several days as well. Uh, we are really focused now on what is it that we need to do to bring this power back up. But as we go into the recovery and as we continue to recover from Maria, we want to make sure that we're rebuilding and supporting Puerto Rico and making sure we're rebuilding it in a way that it's more resilient, that it can support and withstand future events like this. And your colleague Ann Bank from the Office of Response and Recovery testified before Congress just last Thursday. And we learned that out of the $9.5 billion that was set aside five years ago, only 1.5 of that sum has been dispersed. Why isn't the money able to flow faster? You know, what happens after an event like Hurricane Maria, I mean, it's catastrophic, which means that we have really complicated recovery efforts that need to happen. And what happens in the beginning in the first year or so is that we're really focused on those life-saving measures and those temporary measures that can get these communities up and running while we start to rebuild. And when we're talking about catastrophic events like this, uh, we want to make sure that we're taking the time needed to include that resilience piece, right? That we're not just rebuilding it back the way it was, that we're rebuilding it in a way that's going to make it stronger. And these types of projects just take time because there's a lot of damage, a lot of complicated recovery. We want to make sure that we're getting it right. And so when you say it takes a lot of time, obviously there's no particular timetable when you're talking about something of this magnitude, but a lot of people think, you know, critics will say, well, five years was enough time and we still weren't ready after Maria. I would say we were ready after Maria. Again, what happens after big catastrophic events like that? These are, those are incredibly complicated recovery efforts that need to happen. And some of these projects are just going to take time because we, again, we want to make sure that we're spending the time up front to include things like uh, improved resilience, improved infrastructure to withstand the impacts in the future instead of just quickly repairing it so it can uh, withstand or going back to what it was um, originally uh, intended to do, right? We, we need to take that time to make it better. And that's why we spend the first part of our recovery efforts always focused on those temporary measures just to get things up and running while we take the time to build back better to make sure our projects are more resilient. FEMA Administrator Deanne Criswell, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming on the show. All right, thank you, Lindsay. And let's get right to Rob Marciano. Uh, Rob, this hurricane is still expected to strengthen? Yeah, as a matter of fact, Lindsay, the National Hurricane Center has ramped up the intensity forecast. Could be as strong as a Category 4 before it's done. And I want to show you the satellite picture. You can see uh, quite vividly here a distinct eye is now forming north of the Dominican Republic. So it's a Category 2 storm with 100-mile-an-hour winds, but very close to becoming a Cat 3. It'll be that in short order. It's now 120 miles from Turks and Caicos, and it'll be there tomorrow morning. But we're not done with it on the DR, nor in, in, in Puerto Rico. More bands of rain will be heading over the island. Another half a foot of rain already 
inundated across that island, so more flooding is, is expected. Here's the track across uh, Turks and Caicos, actually just to the east of Grand Turks by tomorrow morning, but that eye will be pummeling, uh, especially on the west side of the storm. After that, it's open water Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday. That's when we expect it to become at least a Category 4 storm. Next stop is Bermuda. Early Friday could be a direct hit right now. It looks to be just to the west of that, so Bermuda will be on the dirty side of that storm and then into the Canadian Maritimes. But up and down the east coast of the U.S., from Miami to Maine, we're looking at high surf and rip currents, big waves pounding the east coast pretty much all this week, Lindsay. And before you go, Rob, thousands of miles away in western Alaska, that region is now recovering tonight from an unprecedented typhoon. We saw the homes uh, just floating in the water. Uh, what happened there? This is a remarkable uh, storm, Lindsay. And you know, a lot of these uh, fall storms that come into the Pacific Northwest and into Alaska are our former typhoons that were in the uh, in the in the uh, Western Pacific. This is no different. It was massive. I mean, the size of this thing was pretty much would take up the entire western half of the continental uh, U.S. And it had low pressure. That was one of the lowest, deepest lows, strongest storms on record there in the Bering Sea. It shot right between uh, Russia and Alaska as it headed into the Arctic Circle. And it kind of sits there right now. It's not moving much over the northwestern corner of of, uh, of Alaska, so winds still 60, 70 miles. This is still happening, still a storm, a storm, a strong storm surge and still a coastal flooding uh, and erosion there. Many communities are still having to evacuate there. We saw a lot of dramatic video out of Nome and uh, a lot of residents had to seek shelter because of this storm and it's not quite done. It's just gonna have to sit and spin, but you're right. It was a historic event for our 49th state. Lindsay. Rob Marciano, our thanks to you as always. You got it. Now to England, where Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was laid to rest today. Her final goodbye was marked by tributes and tradition, ushering in a historic transformation, transition for the crown. It was a funeral befitting a queen, and ABC's Kira Phillips was right there. Tonight, the final farewell to Queen Elizabeth II. We gather from across the nation, from the Commonwealth, and from the nations of the world. Her Majesty coming home to her final resting place at Windsor, reunited with the love of her life, her husband, Prince Philip, her rock throughout an unprecedented 70 years of British rule. At every step of the way, members of the royal family, the nation and the world watching in tribute. The day began as the Queen's coffin journeyed from Westminster Hall, where for four days, hundreds of thousands of people lined the streets of London to pay respect to Her Majesty. To the medieval Westminster Abbey for her funeral, slowly walking behind his mother, King Charles III, and nestled within the wreath atop her coffin, his handwritten note, in loving and devoted memory. Her allegiance to God was given before any person gave allegiance to her. This abbey, the same place Queen Elizabeth was married and her coronation carried out. The momentous occasion steeped in grand tradition planned for decades by the 96-year-old monarch herself. Her late majesty famously declared on a 21st birthday broadcast that her whole life would be dedicated to serving the nation and commonwealth. Rarely has such a promise been so well kept. Nearly 2,000 guests, more than 90 world leaders and dignitaries looking onward. President Biden and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden among them. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. King Charles with Queen Consort Camilla by his side, often stoic, though at times showing the weight of the emotion. We pray today especially for all her family, grieving as every family at a funeral. All the Queen's children, grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren there in attendance. And Prince George, now second in line to the throne. And seven-year-old Princess Charlotte, wearing a little horseshoe brooch 
given to her by the Queen. The quiet family tributes, the Princess of Wales wearing a pearl necklace, a gift from Her Majesty, Prince William and Prince Harry again side by side in grief, with the Duchess of Sussex there to say her goodbye. As the funeral bells rang, the coffin traveled for Windsor Castle. Onlookers tossing flowers as the procession moved past. The Queen's coffin then carried into St. George's Chapel, the same chapel where Her Majesty mourned the loss of her Prince Philip just a year ago. The chapel's walls echoing with the sounds of the choir, a sermon about her servanthood and the Lord's Prayer recited. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Windsor Castle, a fitting place for these final moments, a place of refuge for Queen Elizabeth, often seen riding her horses, even her beloved corgis outside the castle today. The end of a journey that began 11 days ago at Balmoral Castle in Scotland, where the Queen peacefully passed away, now reunited with her husband, sister, and parents. The Queen's personal piper, who awakened her every morning outside her window, now playing for his Queen one final time. Her imperial state crown, scepter and orb, put back on the velvet pillows, signaling the end of her reign. Her late majesty's broadcast during COVID lockdown ended with, we will meet again. Words of hope. All who follow the queen's example and inspiration of trust and faith in God can with her say, we will meet again. Now, 73-year-old King Charles III, a son stepping up, a new era for a new Britain. God save the king. from London and Kira you know I was gonna say what a day it's been of, of festivities but really it, what a 12 day span um, of tributes and um, all of this honor um, and, and paying tribute to uh, the Queen you've been there uh, for the the entire thing and, and of course uh, we love to talk about uh, women and and faith and and so I'd ask you just to kind of reflect on that I mean for for 70 plus years now um, that's all uh, uh, the people there in the UK have known is is a woman on the throne and and now we have this big transition that's exactly what I wanted to talk about I know that I was asked what stood out this whole week and a half that I've been here and, and it's those two things first of all I did not realize how faithful the Queen was and this explains a lot Lindsay uh, the fact that she was into the Bible, into the Word every single day. She didn't miss church. She had this incredible relationship with uh, different churches, uh, different leaders of faith, uh, all of whom you saw represented at her funeral today. I had the chance to talk to Reverend Franklin Graham, you know, the son of, of Reverend Billy Graham, uh, with whom I interviewed years ago before he passed away. He had mentioned that he had a relationship with the Queen, but he kept it very private. And today I had the chance to talk to faith leaders and to Franklin Graham about that relationship. The Queen saw him here in London when he was on his world tour of, of sermons and she was fascinated by him and invited him back for a private service um, at, at the castle. And uh, he helped her with one of her Christmas broadcasts one year. They had private moments and conversations about her faith. And you just think about 70 years and you never saw her lose her cool. It makes sense. A lot in common with you, Kira Phillips. Never see you lose your composure either. Kira, we, we thank you so much for just, you know, the, the remarkable work that you've been doing this entire time. Really appreciate your perspective. Thanks, Lindsay.
Now to the war in Ukraine, where a Russian missile is reported to have struck less than 1,000 feet from another nuclear power plant, the second largest in Ukraine. Ukraine's President Zelensky issued a warning that Russia has to be stopped, quote, before it's too late. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge has the latest from Ukraine. Tonight, Russia attacking near another nuclear site in Ukraine after months of shelling close to a nuclear plant in Zaporizhia. Now, a missile damaging this power station north of the port city of Mykolaiv, according to Ukraine, raising concerns about a possible nuclear disaster. And tonight, new horrors uncovered in Izium, the city recently retaken from Russian forces. They've now removed more than 150 bodies from the burial site. Investigators saying dozens of victims died in violent ways. We met Alexander searching here, his son missing for weeks since Russian soldiers raided his apartment. Alexander's son, Alexander, had picked up a Ukrainian military jacket that he found, and potentially that was the only crime he committed in the eyes of the Russian authorities. I had a bad dream, he told us, and then I realized I would never see my son again. Lindsay, the Pentagon tonight saying that the amount of territory that Ukrainian forces recaptured in that recent offensive is equivalent in size to Rhode Island and Delaware combined. Lindsay? Massive amounts of land there are thanks to you, Tom. The man who was the subject of the wildly popular serial podcast debut season had his murder conviction vacated this afternoon. Adnan Syed left a Baltimore courtroom after a judge accused the state of withholding crucial evidence in the original trial that could have exonerated him. Syed, who is now 41 years old, was sentenced to life in prison back in 1999 for the murder of his ex-girlfriend, Heyman Lee. The judge has ordered Syed to remain in home detention with an ankle monitor while the state decides its next steps. And now let's bring in ABC News legal contributor and managing partner at the Cochrane firm, Shauna Lloyd. Shauna, good to have you back on the show. It's been a while. Always uh, good to be here. So we know that the judge vacated the case over new evidence not presented during his original trial. What was the evidence and, and why was it so pivotal in the case? So there were a number of pieces of evidence that were not introduced at the trial previously. We have, there's information that there was a potential alibi that was never interviewed. There's also now some DNA evidence, which has new analysis properties now that it didn't have then. But there were also other suspects that were linked to possibly making statements against the victim and or having other incidences that could have been considered during the original trial. These are pivotal because there is something called a Brady violation, which means that the state is required to turn over any evidence that could show the innocence of the defendant. And when they don't do that, that is the basis by which they are required. The Supreme Court has found it to be a right that they have to do. So when they violate that, you have to vacate the sentence and potentially have a new trial. And the investigation is not closed. What are the options prosecutors will consider at this time? Right now, the judge has given them 30 days to determine if they're going to have a new trial or if they're going to drop the charges. Also, with all of this new information coming to light, they could bring charges against a totally different individual. And in your experience, how likely do you think it is that Syed will get a new trial and what are the chances that he'd be convicted again? When we're looking at this type of evidence, I mean, when we're talking about a potential alibi that jurors never heard from, we have these individuals that could have also been suspects. I mean, that's that's a very vast deviation from the narrative that was given during the original trial. So I think if we see this retried, I think you see a different outcome with this information being brought in. The Serial Podcast made a point about reasonable doubt. It, what's the burden of proof needed in a case like this? In a criminal trial, it is the highest burden of proof. You are required to prove the charges beyond a reasonable doubt, which means that you can't really think there may have been another possibility. You can't have questions. This is something that is, is such a high burden because we are talking about people's life and liberty that is being subjected to imprisonment. So we have to hold to this very high burden of beyond a reasonable doubt. And of course, the podcast certainly contributed to the attention that this case received. But how much do you think that it had an influence on this legal outcome? Are, are there similar cases often reconsidered? 
Absolutely. When we see cases that have these types of gross deviations from what the criminal justice system is requiring and what's required by law, you know, the rights that were um, that were overrode in this case, you know, some of his fundamental rights were not were not honored in, when this particular trial. So when you see something of that magnitude, you often will see a, a sentence that is vacated because we are built on certain fundamental truths and fundamental laws. That's what makes the United States this great country. And one of them is ensuring that the criminal justice system abides by the rules in which they have to. And this information that they had was something that absolutely should have been given over. So I think the podcast brought attention to something, but the gross oversight that happened and what occurred, even the prosecutors stood up to say, we don't have confidence in this particular conviction. Shauna Lloyd, always good to talk to you. Thanks so much. Always great to see you, Lindsay. And when we come back, scary moments when a plane crashes into someone's front yard. And is the pandemic over? Why President Biden says it is. But first, millions are at risk as Somalia hangs on the edge of a famine. Children are suffering and starving, but there are not enough resources to help everyone. Our Matt Gutman visited the region, documenting the hardships and tragedies of hunger. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families trunk. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on the tough questions with straightforward reporting. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Dangerous moments in a neighborhood when a plane crashes into someone's front yard. Two people were killed when the small yellow aircraft craft came down in southern New Jersey this afternoon. Investigators are trying to figure out what happened in the moments right before the crash. In recent weeks, the U.N. Security Council has warned of a tsunami of hunger that could trigger multiple famines around the world, and it's already causing one person to die 
every four seconds. That means in the amount of time that it just took me to say that, someone lost their life to hunger. In Somalia alone, millions are at risk. While a famine has not been officially declared, there are many in this instance say that the label doesn't matter because officials say it's already begun. Our Matt Gutman files this haunting account. They sing to the camels because this drought is breaking even the desert's hardiest animal. Healthy camels can go two weeks without water, but not a starving one. They belong to Ali's family, once a sign of wealth. Now his finger traces their bony ribs and hips, a map of his community's hunger. What does it mean when the camels start to die? The family's herds of hundreds decimated. And across the country, grazing grounds have turned into graveyards. The country south is on the brink of an official famine, and already untold thousands have died, many on the way to camps like this. And the majority of the dead are children. We traveled to Somalia to spend a week on the front lines of what could be the world's deadliest climate change disaster. Triggering a food crisis that has left 22 million people in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia starving. The epicenter is Somalia, where over half the country's children under five suffer malnutrition and 500,000 have severe acute malnutrition, meaning their bodies are shutting down. <coughs> We flew on a UN charter to accompany a mission by the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization into Somalia's heartland. We traveled in a long convoy flanked by squads of police because parts of this country are still controlled by the Al Shabaab, Al Qaeda's affiliate in Somalia. Off the country's main north south highway, every road is a dirt track. So our convoy cars through the dust to communities deep in this moonscape. Livestock here are a family's fridge and bank account. And to keep them alive, the FAO dispatches water tankers. And when they arrive, some of the animals run to the trough. Others too weak to make it off their knees. At one of the stops, we found the FAO senior technical advisor tenderly kneeling near a dying goat. Are you watching both animals and humans get weaker and weaker? The livestock is for everything, for discriminities. No livestock, no life. And it was nearby where we met Ali. With his brother in the hospital, he was helping keep the family's few surviving animals alive and checks on his niece, Berlin. She's 18, and in her arms is little Mohammed, just five months old. <laughs> she said she no longer produces milk. Now the powdered milk they buy by the ounce is the most precious item in the household. Whatever doesn't make it into the bottle, the goat gets. Finally, Mohammed drinks and is quiet. What does this place look like when there's a lot of rain? The livestock of traditional herders accounted for about 80% of Somalia's exports, feeding the wealthy of the Arab world. Now most of the herders subsist on a single meal of plain rice every day. Barlin telling us her days used to be non-stop. But now she sits and waits for the rains. Her goats haven't provided milk in two years, she tells us. Her daughter Fatima brought out the milking cup they used to use. This vessel used to contain milk. They would drink out of it and milk the goats into it, but this dust is all it contains right now. Now there's nothing to do but wait for the next rains. Climatologists predict this rainy season, typically running from October to December, will likely be too late and bring too little rain. And UN agencies can't help the vast majority of families like Barlin's. The FAO has increased its target for emergency support from about 880,000 people to over 2.3 million. 
But the agency says the campaign is only 24% funded. They have no crops that they can fall back on. Food prices are at an elevated level, so um, they can't go to the market and purchase what they need in order to survive. So what we're seeing is that people are leaving their hometowns, are trekking hundreds of kilometers into the urban areas, moving into IDP camps in the hope of receiving assistance. And across the country, roughly the size of Texas, trucks bearing whole families and their flock are on the move. Four families has hired this truck. All their livestock are on there. You can see they're packed in there. On top is where they have tarps, their tents, all their possessions, and of course, family members. And they're heading north of here because they heard in a town called Basasso there might be rain. Many who escape head for a southern town called Baidoa. Everywhere, those tents. UN agencies try to keep families in their communities, fearing that camp life creates a lifelong dependency and the journey there can be deadly. They hope that being in the camp give them the visibility that they need, but it end up being a perilous journey because most of them die on their way to the camp or die immediately they reach the camp out of exhaustion. The women here have been waiting for treatment at a Save the Children nutrition site. It's four times as busy as it was just a year ago. Inside the pediatric center, dozens of mothers waiting for their turn. One of the mothers signals for me to come over. She's so incredibly thin. What, what's the name of her baby? She says her name is Garan Hassan, and she shows me her daughter, Malaika, just 18 months old and so desperately thin. She tells me that she had to sell the family plot just to pay for the ride in a packed car to get to Baidoa. That was all the money they had left. Her husband, she says, died at the beginning of the hunger. Soon, a health worker wraps Malaika's tiny arm in that tape measure. It's barely two inches around. Then, like other children who don't have the strength to stand on a scale, they weigh her in that bucket. As it slowly twists around, Malaika doesn't fuss. She just stares ahead, glassy-eyed. Baby Malaika here weighs just over 11 pounds. Finally, they test her appetite with a nut-based ration. It's funded by the U.S. government and distributed by the millions. These packets are designed to taste like candy, but offer an immediate boost to a starving child. <coughs> but Malaika is simply too sick to eat, too weak to cry. In the previous famine in 2011, nearly 260,000 people died. Most of them were children. And this time, Somalia has yet to declare an official famine. Who made the declaration of famine is irrelevant. Because right now, look, look around you. What is this if this is not famine? Humanitarian groups, including the UN, are united on this. But after baby Malaika is registered, Garen Hassan tells the staff she can't go to the stabilization center because she has six other children to care for. But the next day, the Save the Children staff send a team to Garen Hassan's hut for a welfare check. What's inside that tent isn't good. Garen Hassan's children were clinging to their mother and to life. Malaika's older brother is Nadifa. He's three, but the size of a one-year-old. She's so cold to the touch, it's, it's actually a little scary. Garen Hassan tells me they had fevers all night long. Ducking under the tarp, a worker and Garen Hassan rushed the children to a waiting van. They bump down the road to the hospital and emerge in that courtyard. The staff processes the children, and you can hear Nadifa keep saying, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty. Malaika is so weak, she doesn't even make a sound when an IV port is inserted into her hand. Once inside the hospital, Nadifa continues to croak that he's thirsty. First, they try to force him to drink easy to digest formula called F75. Then a nurse props him on his lap and hands him a cup. Gulps it down, then he's handed another. Drinks that one down too. The boy's mouth is framed in a milk mustache, and for the first time in a long time, his mother 
smiles. Lindsay, two things struck me from our week here on the ground. The first is how gutting it is that so many of these pediatric deaths are preventable if only those children can get to treatment. The other is the ubiquity of this hunger crisis. We were in the north and here in the south. It is everywhere. Livestock are dying and people are dying as well. And right now, humanitarian agencies are so woefully strapped financially, they're operating on just a fraction of their budgets that they can't help everyone. They're triaging assistance, basically taking from the hungry to feed the starving. Lindsay. So glad that you were pointing this out for us, Matt, and nothing like seeing that little frothy milk mustache of the little baby. Our thanks to Matt. Still ahead here on Prime, the American contractor held hostage in Afghanistan for more than two years is finally freed. We'll talk with one of the senators, his family thanked for this new development. A stark reminder of the dangers so many face during childbirth and the special vault that will hold Queen Elizabeth II and who she is joining. We'll take a look by the numbers, but first our tweet of the day from the serial podcasters. A new episode drops tomorrow morning. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back. After a state funeral at Westminster with millions watching around the world, Queen Elizabeth's coffin was lowered into the royal vault at Windsor Castle. Let's take a look at the history of the royal vault and what will be the queen's final resting place by the numbers. The royal vault is a burial chamber about 16 feet below St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. It was built starting in 1804 by orders of King George III and currently serves as the final resting place for 24 royal family members, including four kings. After his death, 18 months ago, Queen Elizabeth's husband, Prince Philip, was interred in the royal vault as well. But while the 96-year-old queen's coffin was lowered into the royal vault today, she and her husband of 73 years, Prince Philip, were later relocated to the nearby King George VI Memorial Chapel in a private family ceremony. Built in 1969, the Memorial Chapel is where her father, King George VI, and the Queen Mother are buried, along with her sister, Princess Margaret. And after some waited as long as 14 hours in recent days to view the queen's coffin line, 
lying in state, the British people will be able to pay their respects at the Queen's final resting place, which will reopen to the public in the near future. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The sentence handed down in court today for a woman convicted of faking her own kidnapping, sparking a massive search. Plus, the new WNBA champions, how the team and its coach made history. First, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. So much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find. Unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Stirring scenes of British pageantry and royal tradition on full display for Queen Elizabeth's final goodbye. Bells from London to Windsor tolling through the Queen's funeral. The coffin met with a gun salute at Windsor Castle for that final mile to her resting place at St. George's Chapel. In London, members from every branch of Britain's military on hand for the rare state funeral. It began Monday morning at Westminster Hall. Paul Bearers drawing the gun carriage with the Queen's flag draped coffin. King Charles leading his siblings and his children in the royal procession behind the Queen's coffin to Westminster Abbey, the church where Queen Elizabeth was crowned as a monarch more than 70 years ago and where she was married. A day after Hurricane Fiona slammed Puerto Rico, more than a million people still don't have power. At least one death is blamed on the hurricane. Fiona making landfall Sunday as a Category 1 storm, bringing torrential rain of more than two feet in some parts of the island, along with wind gusts over 100 miles per hour. Fiona is the third hurricane of the Atlantic hurricane season, sparking a flash flood emergency across Puerto Rico, with one river rising 13 feet in just one hour. In one one mountain town rushing water washing away this newly constructed bridge built after Hurricane Maria. President Biden says the U.S. is entering a new phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic is over. We still have a problem with COVID. We're still doing a lot of work on it. 
Uh, it's what the pandemic is over. Biden made the statement during a wide-ranging interview on 60 Minutes. The U.S. is seeing a decline in reported infections and virus-related hospitalizations, but there are still just under 400 COVID-related deaths per day. Last week, the director general of the World Health Organization said the pandemic wasn't over, but the end was in sight. The California woman behind a major kidnapping hoax that grabbed national attention has been sentenced to 18 months in prison. Sherry Papini apologized for her actions in court before receiving her sentence. She had pled guilty in April to engaging in mail fraud and making false statements. Papini vanished in November 2016, prompting a national search for her and then for her captors once she resurfaced a few weeks later. But officials found she was with an ex-boyfriend that entire time. A report from the CDC says the vast majority of pregnancy-related deaths in this country are preventable. According to new data from committees that review maternal mortality across the country, four out of every five women who die during pregnancy could be saved. The numbers show most women died of mental health conditions, including deaths due to suicide or substance abuse disorders. But other causes of death included excessive bleeding, heart conditions, and infections. Recommendations for improvement include better access to insurance coverage, better transportation to hospitals, and more follow-up with new moms after the baby is born. A new champion in the WNBA, the Las Vegas Aces have won the first title in team history, beating the Connecticut Sun in four games. In a competitive Game 4, Finals MVP Chelsea Gray led all scorers with 20 points. It was an historic night in different ways for the top-seeded team in the playoffs. Head coach Becky Hammond became the first coach in league history to win a title in her debut season as head coach, and the team became the first Las Vegas professional sports team to win a championship. An American contractor held hostage in Afghanistan for more than two and a half years has now been released by the Taliban in a prisoner exchange. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddich joins us now. Uh, Martha, uh, tell us more about Mark Frerichs and the circumstances of his captivity and what's being done to help him after his release. Well, Mark Frerichs was working, as you said, as a contractor. He was working with aid organization. He's a trained civil engineer. And in January 2020, he was lured into a meeting. And at that meeting in Kabul, uh, the Taliban basically abducted him. And he has been missing ever since. There was a hostage video that was released. The New Yorker got a hostage video uh, last, late last year where Mark Frerich was asking Afghanistan, asking the Taliban to free him. These negotiations have been going on for months about this prisoner exchange. He was finally released. Right now he is in Qatar. Uh, he is under the care of, of doctors there. They say his health is stable and he's doing well. So I believe he'll be on his way home very soon. His family, of course, is delighted by this. But the prisoner exchange was for a drug lord, a drug trafficker from Afghanistan uh, that the U.S. did detained back in about 2005 or arrested him rather in about 2005 and he was convicted in 2009 giving a given a prison sentence of life he was exchanged for mark frerichs a difficult decision president biden says yeah a difficult decision we can imagine martha raddatz our, our thanks to you as always you bet for more on this we are joined now by democratic senator tammy duckworth of illinois senator Thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Uh, Mark Frerichs and his family are from your state of Illinois. How did you find out his release had finally been secured after more than 31 months in captivity? And, and what was your reaction to the news? Well, I received notice this morning at 0545 local, um, and I was just thrilled. They said that he's, uh, his release is imminent um, and they, uh, from the administration. And uh, so we were very excited that, that was happening and just sort of holding our breath until we knew for sure he was in American hands. And uh, after two and a half years of captivity, it's great that we have this Navy veteran home. 0545, clearly your military roots evident there. Have you spoken with Mark's family? How are they feeling today? And when will they be able to reunite with him? Well, I did not, I've not yet spoken with his family today. I've received messages from them. Uh, they're just jubilant. Um, you know, he's making his way home right now. Um, but obviously, after two and a half years in captivity by a uh, terrorist, uh, you or I, anyone would need to go and check in with our doctors and get a get, get a medical checkup. So that's probably what's going to be next for him. Um, and then uh, uh, hopefully he'll come home and then we'll all get to see him in person finally.
And in a statement, his family expressed their thanks to the Biden administration, as well as to you and, and your fellow Illinois Senator Dick Durbin. And right, they wrote, uh, Senator Duckworth got personally involved advocating tirelessly within our government to get him home. Can you give us a sense, Senator, of what you've been doing behind the scenes to, to try to help secure his release? Well, it's been over two years of um, pulling every lever of power. You know, I'm, I'm as you said, I'm an old soldier. Uh, the soldiers create is we don't leave a, a fallen comrade behind and we don't we don't leave a, a buddy behind and uh, i took this very personally I, I i was once shot down um sitting in a broken helicopter behind enemy lines as the bad guys were coming to try to try to grab me and my buddies and, and luckily i got out of that situation so it meant a lot to me that there was an american behind enemy lines still being held by the terrorists and so um sorry i'm getting a little emotional mm. so i got very involved and uh First started with the Trump administration, trying to make sure that uh, we did everything to keep his his situation in in the front of everyone's minds. Um, then I had a meeting with President Biden very early on um, in uh, 2021 in February, when, right after he took office and, and asked to meet with him. And he met with me in the Oval Office saying, please, whatever we need to do, let's get him home. Um, and then it's been three hard months of negotiating with the Taliban who, you know, kept moving the goalpost around and, 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 and saying, no, you need to get him home. You need to get him back to us, or you're not going to get your guy. And today, we we had success. Marks in American hands, and and hopefully, uh, you know, on to on his way back home soon. And, and Senator, I, I'm struck by you brought up that the motto "Leave nobody behind," and not a lot of people would have the experience uh, that you've had certainly it wasn't that you were left stranded for you know years on end but but kind of give us that that feeling when you are in that helicopter that's down and behind enemy lines what that moment is is like you're praying to be rescued you know we 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 landed probably 300 400 yards from where the bad guys had just shot us down and we knew they were jumping into their pickup trucks headed this way i was wounded but at this point i passed out um, from blood loss and my buddies, you know, who could have gone in to the rescue bird and get out of there. They they wasted precious moments coming back from my body and they did everything they could to save me. And I, I thank them every single day for saving my life because they thought they were recovering a body. They and we know the families of Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan are still waiting on word on the offer for a, a, per, a prisoner exchange with Russia to secure their release. Are you confident that that deal will, will get done to bring both of them home? And I can tell you that I have every confidence in the Biden administration and Secretary Blinken uh, uh, that are negotiating and all of our, uh, our active negotiators that they're doing everything they possibly can to bring Americans home um, the Americans who are being held unjustly uh, overseas home in any way they can, including Ms. Greiner. Senator Tammy Duckworth, we thank you so much for your insight, for your time. Just really appreciate you coming back on the show. Thank you. Before we go tonight, the image of the day, King Charles III and members of the royal family following behind the coffin of Queen Elizabeth II at the end of her state funeral in Westminster Abbey. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things. Hurricane Fiona pummels Puerto Rico, leaving millions on the island in the dark. We look at the damage and speak with one of the top players in the power recovery efforts about the years-long issues with the power grid. Plus, new developments in the case of a doctor accused of contaminating IV bags, allegedly leading to deadly consequences. What investigators say new video reveals. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app, download Load it now. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news.
He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Amber Rose Isaac was the love of my life. She went into the hospital, and then I just see Shimani as... She was as good as dead as soon as she walked into that hospital. Black women are four times more likely to die than their white counterparts with the same symptoms. I can't let Amber be another statistic. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. This fight is not over. We're doing this together, man. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Adnan Syed left court today a free man. A judge in Baltimore overturned his murder conviction and ordered him to be released from prison after serving 23 years behind bars. Syed was sentenced to life for killing his ex-girlfriend at the age of 17. Prosecutors now say they have two other possible suspects. The case gained national attention after being featured on the Serial podcast. New video in a disturbing case that we brought you last week of a North Dallas anesthesiologist who was arrested and charged for allegedly contaminating IV bags used at his surgical center, which resulted in the death of a fellow physician and multiple cardiac emergencies to other patients. The incidents began only two days after he was advised that he was facing a disciplinary inquiry where he, quote, deviated from the standard of care during the procedure. San Antonio area Sheriff Javier Salazar announced that he has opened a criminal investigation into Florida Governor Ron DeSantis's move to send Venezuelan migrants from Texas to Martha's Vineyard. The sheriff said it is his understanding that a Venezuelan migrant was paid to, quote, lure 48 migrants around a migrant resource center under false pretenses and believes criminal activity took place. Now to Hurricane Fiona's wrath and the catastrophic impacts the storm is having on already battered communities in Puerto Rico. Flooding, mudslides, power outages, and water rescues. And tonight, Fiona is pounding the Dominican Republic. Victor Akendo reports tonight from Puerto Rico. Tonight, Hurricane Fiona pummeling the Dominican Republic, making its second landfall as a Category 1 hurricane, as communities across Puerto Rico are inundated with devastating floodwaters. Fiona making its first landfall in the U.S. territory Sunday, winds gusting over 100 miles an hour, ripping off roofs. In the mountain town of Utuado, a torrent of flood water tearing apart this bridge and sweeping it away. It's now been more than 24 hours since Hurricane Fiona made landfall, and the rain just hasn't let up. Some areas could see up to 30 inches of rain. Fiona coming nearly five years to the day since Category 4 Maria. Here in Salinas, Luis Cruz says his home of 36 years, now a total loss. Was it this bad? Was the flooding like this during no, Hurricane no, Maria? Never, never, no, 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 no. Yeah. This is worse now. Oh, yeah. Climate change supercharging the amount of rain hurricanes now bring. Los daños a la infraestructura. Puerto Rico's governor calling the damage catastrophic. The National Guard and first responders rescuing more than a thousand people. Ruben Ramos and his mother Onelia waiting seven hours to be saved. Uh -huh. The water, she says that the water was running just like this, but inside of her house. Nearly the entire island without electricity and hundreds of thousands have no running water. Our thanks to Victor Akendo and joining us now for more context and analysis on Puerto Rico's ongoing power struggles is Manuel Aboy Rivera, the executive director for Core 3, which is the Central Office of Recovery, Reconstruction and Resiliency. Manuel, we thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, let's get right to it. Uh, Puerto Rico is in the dark for the most part right now. Once again, it's due to a hurricane, but power has not been reliable on the island since Maria five years ago. I'm sure it's not an easy task, but we are five years later at this point. Why is it so difficult for a more stable power grid to be constructed? Uh, first of all, right now we are focused on the emergency response uh, to save life, uh, to ensure that you know we protect property and public safety. So that is the focus uh, on the efforts right now due to Hurricane Fiona. But to your question, uh, we got to understand that um, prior to 2021, there were many challenges. 
uh, associated with these processes related to, to FEMA and the federal government. Uh, it, there was uncertainty about the rules that needed to be followed. Uh, it was also focused, as a matter of fact, on the emergency work back uh, related to Irma and Maria. And then finally, after 2021, uh, we were able to work with FEMA and the current federal government to lift restrictions, uh, certain flexibilities that help us now start moving forward with the recovery. And so the recovery process, you're saying, in general, takes years. I mean, is that just the traditional red tape that people have to endure? Well, normally it does take some time, but there was a lot of red tape before. Uh, there were restrictions between 2017 and 2020. And back then, you know, most of the work was for temporary uh, measures and emergency measures. Again, when, when Governor Pierluisi took office in 2021 and I started serving in Court 3, things started to, you know, to change towards the right direction. The current federal government helped us lift in restrictions. They gave us all the support and we started moving projects towards construction. Uh, and there was other challenges associated with the way the FEMA uh, grants work. We got to also remind people that, you know, it's not that they get don't give us the money, it's on the reimbursement basis. So we got to spend money first and then, you know, we ask for reimbursement. And Puerto Rico was also going through bankruptcy and there was limited cash. So there was a number of things that, you know, prohibited Puerto Rico to, to move faster. And, and man, well, of course, you've seen the anti-Luma protests firsthand. Even Bad Bunny, who's arguably the largest global superstar right now, has a song which translated to English means blackout. He's calling for Luma Energy to go. As someone who lives on the island, do you think that Luma is doing a good job? Well, my role is to ensure that Luma executes the reconstruction projects that are funded with FEMA funding related to disaster recovery. That's my primary function. And we are the entity, Core 3, that provides oversight, that ensures that the FEMA funds are used correctly in compliance and with a sense of urgency, and that the work is done uh, in a matter that you know will provide the resiliency that we want for Puerto Rico, uh, not only now, but also for the future. So that's our role. And I can tell you that we have the controls. We have the controls, we have the processes to ensure that the projects are done right and that are done in compliance, and that's our focus. And lastly, I just want to go back to what you said earlier about Fiona setting the path to recovery back. Uh, hurricanes, of course, happen in the, the Caribbean every year. Are there contingency plans in the future for these kinds of natural disasters when rebuilding? Well, we have from a very catastrophic situation that happened in 2017, which was Maria, and then later on you have the earthquakes and the global pandemic. From those catastrophic and sad events, we have this golden opportunity to rebuild and to rebuild better. That's the focus of CON3. And we were making progress prior to Fiona. You know, we had a good plan, we have a strategy, we were able to work with FEMA to ensure that finally the reconstruction started to take off. Now with the Fiona situation, certainly we have to reevaluate. And again, the focus right now is responding to the emergency, saving lives and stabilizing the situation. Manuel Laboy Rivera, the executive director for Core 3 in Puerto Rico, thank you so much for your time. And of course, uh, our thoughts and, and prayers remain with the people of, of Puerto Rico. Thank you. Now to London, where the extraordinary funeral of Queen Elizabeth has wrapped up a ceremony the likes of which we will likely never see again. It was a final farewell to the United Kingdom's longest serving monarch. Her family, including the Queen's successor, King Charles III, right by her side. Our World News Tonight anchor David Muir takes us to the emotional memorial. He reports from London. Tonight, the final farewell, the final journey for Queen Elizabeth. Tens of thousands lining the streets from London to Windsor to witness this moment in history and to pay tribute to a queen who promised at 21 to devote her life to service. The pallbearers from the British Army, eight soldiers from the 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards carrying out the coffin, placing it on the state gun carriage. The procession as the queen's coffin is carried to Westminster Abbey for the state funeral the first since Sir Winston Churchill. The carriage followed by King Charles III and members of Britain's royal family, including the Queen's daughter, Princess Anne, by her mother's side for this entire journey. Her grandsons, Prince William, now the heir to the throne, and Prince Harry, walking together again in a show of unity for their grandmother. Queen Consort Camilla and Catherine, the Princess of Wales, traveling together. William and Catherine deciding to bring their two oldest children, George and Charlotte, 
looking out through the windows as London paid tribute to their great-grandmother. Inside the funeral service, 2,000 guests in attendance. Leaders from all over the world, Britain's current and former prime ministers, Liz Truss, Boris Johnson, Theresa May, and Tony Blair, Canada's prime minister, Justin Trudeau, and President Joe Biden and First Lady Jill Biden walking in, holding hands. The casket entering the abbey as the choir sings. On top of the casket, the royal standard, the sovereign's orb and scepter, and the imperial state crown, the crown she first put on at the end of her coronation right here at Westminster Abbey nearly 70 years ago. The wreath on the coffin with a handwritten note from her son, King Charles, in loving and devoted memory, Charles R. The flowers cut from the gardens of the royal residences, including myrtle, grown from some of the myrtle in the Queen's wedding bouquet in 1947. Of course, married to Philip for 73 years. Prince William, now joined by Princess Catherine and their children. Prince Harry with Duchess Meghan. The view overhead, revealing the scope of the ceremony. Among the hymns, Psalm 23, sung at the Queen's wedding in 1947 to Philip. Theirs was the longest marriage in royal history. Archbishop of Canterbury. Her late majesty famously declared on a 21st birthday broadcast that her whole life would be dedicated to serving the nation and commonwealth. Rarely has such a promise been so well kept. Tens of thousands gathering in nearby Hyde Park to watch the service and pay their respects. Near the end of the service across the United Kingdom, two minutes of silence for their queen. Across Britain, hundreds of thousands moved. Then the congregation singing, God Save the King. Queen Camilla singing next to the king, clearly moved by the moment. Harry and Meghan standing directly behind. The queen's piper, who played for the queen nearly every morning below her window, now playing Sleep, Deary Sleep. The queen who was married and crowned here in Westminster Abbey, leaving for the final time. The procession through the streets of London, Royal Navy sailors pulling her coffin, a nod to the queen's volunteer service during World War II, and of course her role as commander in chief. The procession passing beneath the arch and horse guards parade, the guardsmen filling the space as the massive crowds await on both sides. A short time later, the Queen's coffin would pass the statues of the Queen's mother and father, parents who could never have imagined her 70-year reign, the longest in British history. I felt as she passed, her parents were looking at her and were saying, we're really proud of you. You've done a great job. The Queen's coffin passing by the royal balcony at Buckingham Palace, where just this past June, she last waved to the crowds here. The procession making its way toward Wellington Arch, where the Queen's coffin was transferred from the carriage to the state hearse, the design approved by the Queen for the 25-mile trip to Windsor Castle. The royal family looking on, her great-grandchildren, Prince George and Princess Charlotte, standing in front of Prince William and Princess Catherine. King Charles saluting as the hearse pulls away. Princess Anne, again, in the car behind the coffin. It was her mother's wish that her daughter be near every part of this final journey, from Balmoro back to London, and now as she leaves for Windsor for the last time. And then the two-hour drive to Windsor. Along the route, her coffin seen through the large clear glass, in Windsor, traveling the long walk. So many people along the route throwing flowers in honor of their queen. Look at all the flowers that are there on the hearse. Arriving at Windsor Castle, the view of the crowds through the archway. Look at that view. Look at <laughs> that, that is view. Extraordinary. That is it's extraordinary. And waiting there, members of the royal family, even Queen Elizabeth's corgis, waiting for the Queen's arrival. The Reverend Dr. Ian Greenshields, who shared dinner with the Queen the weekend before she died while he was visiting Balmoral. And he told us today her memory was as sharp as ever. She was engaged in conversation. And he told us about her walk to the window.
She took me over to the window and she, she was just showing me uh, the different gardens uh, and flower beds that were there and just pointing out uh, her, her, just the estate that brought her so much comfort and peace in her life. She spoke of it and said that she had no regrets uh, having started that journey uh, of faith. She had no regrets at all. No regrets for a queen who pledged to serve as a young woman. Inside St. George's Chapel, the finality of this moment in history. The scepter and orb carefully taken off the coffin. Then the imperial state crown removed, marking the end of Queen Elizabeth's reign. The Lord Chamberlain, the most senior role appointed by the royal household, breaking his wand to signify the end of service to the queen. The coffin lowered into the royal vault. The queen's piper playing his final song for the queen. The music hanging in the air, fading into the distance as he walked away. Then inside the chapel, God save the king. Tonight, the queen has been laid to rest with her mother and father and sister, Princess Margaret. And she is now alongside her husband of 73 years, the late Prince Philip. And as the world said goodbye to the queen today, we remembered what she said not so long ago during the pandemic. Words that are just as meaningful tonight. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. Now to King Charles III. He is grieving the loss of his mother as he steps up to take charge of her realm. ABC's foreign correspondent James Longman joins us now from London. James, uh, what do you think we can expect from King Charles as a monarch? Well, Lindsay, I do think he has challenges ahead of him. He is absolutely not as popular as his mother was, um, but I do think he has the goodwill of the public uh, before him. Uh, what he'll want is a slimmed-down monarchy. We know that. He does want to rely on the team, and there is no, uh, there was no kind of mistake today. That's why we saw George and Charlotte there in the pews, because he wants to show the public that this is the future of the monarchy, this next generation. He also understands that he has to appeal to 21st century Britain, a uh, multi-faith, multi-ethnic community which wants to feel that the monarchy is relevant to them. I think also you're going to see a cerebral monarchy, a cerebral king in a way that perhaps uh, Queen Elizabeth enjoyed sort of simple pleasures, outdoor pursuits. This is someone who likes the arts, uh, much more of a, a metropolitan king, if you like. I think we'll probably see a little less horse racing and a little more Shakespeare. Um, above all, though, he will want to remain above the fray, follow his mother's example, stay out of politics and be an icon like his mother was. Lindsay? A little less opinionated than the version we saw as a prince. James Longman, our, our thanks to you. Just tireless and great work all week. Thanks, Lindsay. And still to come, reports of a powerful earthquake rocking Mexico, what we know at this hour. But up next, our Matt Gutman on the ground in Somalia, where millions are at risk of dying of hunger. It is a global catastrophe with devastating consequences. Stay with us. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live.
My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. A powerful earthquake struck western Mexico, killing at least one person, damaging buildings, knocking out power, and sending residents of Mexico City scrambling onto city streets for safety. The mayor of Mexico City said there were no immediate reports of damage in the capital after the tremors, which rumbled through Mexico on the same day as major quakes battered the country in 1985 and 2017. Hurricane Fiona impacts were also felt in the Dominican Republic. Fiona jolted palm trees amid fierce winds that knocked out power lines and advertisements in various towns in the eastern part of the Caribbean nation. Fortunately, relief groups said there were no immediate reports of injuries. Growing unrest persisted on social media this past weekend as Iranians fumed over the death of a young woman in the custody of morality police enforcing strict hijab rules. The 22-year-old died on Friday after falling into a coma following her arrest in Tehran earlier in the week, putting a spotlight on women's rights. Police rejected social media suspicions that she had been beaten, saying that she fell ill as she waited with other detained women. In recent weeks, the U.N. Security Council warned of a tsunami of hunger that could trigger multiple famines around the world. It's already causing one person to die every four seconds in the amount of time it just took me to say that someone lost their life to hunger. In Somalia alone, millions are at risk. While famine has yet to be declared, there are many say in this instance, labels don't matter because officials say the reality is it's already begun. Our Matt Gutman just returned from the region and filed this haunting account. They sing to the camels because this drought is breaking even the desert's hardiest animal. Healthy camels can go two weeks without water, but not a starving one. They belong to Ali's family, once a sign of wealth. Now his finger traces their bony ribs and hips a map of his community's hunger. What does it mean when the camels start to die? The family's herds of hundreds decimated. And across the country, grazing grounds have turned into graveyards. The country south is on the brink of an official famine, and already untold thousands have died, many on the way to camps like this. And the majority of the dead are children. We traveled to Somalia to spend a week on the front lines of what could be the world's deadliest climate change disaster. Triggering a food crisis that has left 22 million people in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia starving. The epicenter is Somalia, where over half the country's children under five suffer malnutrition and 500,000 have severe acute malnutrition, meaning their bodies are shutting down. <coughs> we flew on a UN charter to accompany a mission by the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization into Somalia's heartland. We traveled in a long convoy flanked by squads of police because parts of this country are still controlled by the al-Shabaab, al-Qaeda's affiliate in Somalia. Off the country's main north-south highway, every road is a dirt track. So our convoy cars through the dust to communities deep in this moonscape. Livestock here are a family's fridge and bank account, and to keep them alive, the FAO dispatches water tankers. And when they arrive, some of the animals run to the trough, others too weak to make it off their knees. At one of the stops, we found the FAO senior technical advisor tenderly kneeling near a dying goat. Are you watching both animals and humans get weaker and weaker? The livestock is for everything, for discriminities. No livestock, no life. And it was nearby where we met Ali. With his brother in the hospital, he was helping keep the family's few surviving animals alive and checks on his niece, Berlin. 
She's 18, and in her arms is little Mohammed, just five months old. <laughs> she said she no longer produces milk. Now the powdered milk they buy by the ounce is the most precious item in the household. Whatever doesn't make it into the bottle, the goat gets. Finally, Muhammad drinks and is quiet. What does this place look like when there's a lot of rain? The livestock of traditional herders accounted for about 80% of Somalia's exports, feeding the wealthy of the Arab world. Now, most of the herders subsist on a single meal of plain rice every day. Bar Lynn telling us her days used to be nonstop. But now, she sits and waits for the rains. Her daughter Fatima brought out the milking cup they used to use. This vessel used to contain milk. They would drink out of it and milk the goats into it, but this dust is all it contains right now. Now, there's nothing to do but wait for the next rains. Climatologists predict this rainy season, typically running from October to December, will likely be too late and bring too little rain. And UN agencies can't help the vast majority of families like Barlin's. The FAO has increased its target for emergency support from about 880,000 people to over 2.3 million. But the agency says the campaign is only 24% funded. They have no crops that they can fall back on. Food prices are at an elevated level, so um, they can't go to the market and purchase what they need in order to survive. So what we're seeing is that people are leaving their hometowns, are trekking hundreds of kilometers into the urban areas, moving into IDP camps in the hope of receiving assistance. And across the country, roughly the size of Texas, trucks bearing whole families and their flock are on the move. This group of four families has hired this truck. All their livestock are on there. You can see they're packed in there. On top is where they have tarps, their tents, all their possessions, and of course, family members. And they're heading north of here because they heard in a town called Basasso there might be rain. Many who escape head for a southern town called Baidoa. Everywhere, those tents. UN agencies try to keep families in their communities, fearing that camp life creates a lifelong dependency and the journey there can be deadly. They hope that being in the camp give them the visibility that they need, but it end up being a perilous journey because most of them die on their way to the camp or die immediately they reach the camp out of exhaustion. The women here have been waiting for treatment at a Save the Children nutrition site. It's four times as busy as it was just a year ago. Inside the pediatric center, dozens of mothers waiting for their turn. One of the mothers signals for me to come over. She's so incredibly thin. What, what's the name of her baby? She says her name is Garan Hassan, and she shows me her daughter, Malaika, just 18 months old and so desperately thin. She tells me that she had to sell the family plot just to pay for the ride in a packed car to get to Baidoa. That was all the money they had left. Her husband, she says, died at the beginning of the hunger. Soon, a health worker wraps Malaika's tiny arm in that tape measure. It's barely two inches around. Then, like other children who don't have the strength to stand on a scale, they weigh her in that bucket. As it slowly twists around, Malaika doesn't fuss. She just stares ahead, glassy-eyed. Baby Malaika here weighs just over 11 pounds. Finally, they test her appetite with a nut-based ration. It's funded by the U.S. government and distributed by the millions. These packets are designed to taste like candy, but offer an immediate boost to a starving child. <coughs> but Malaika is simply too sick to eat, too weak to cry. In the previous famine in 2011, nearly 260,000 people died. Most of them were children. And this time, Somalia has yet to declare an official famine. For me, the declaration of famine is irrelevant. 
Because right now, look, look around you. What is this if this is not family? Humanitarian groups, including the UN, are united on this. But after baby Malaika is registered, Garen Hassan tells the staff she can't go to the stabilization center because she has six other children to care for. But the next day, the Save the Children staff send a team to Garen Hassan's hut for a welfare check. What's inside that tent isn't good. Garen Hassan's children were clinging to their mother and to life. Malaika's older brother is Nadifa. He's three, but the size of a one-year-old. She's so cold to the touch, it's, it's actually a little scary. Garen Hassan tells me they had fevers all night long. Ducking under the tarp, a worker and Garen Hassan rushed the children to a waiting van. They bump down the road to the hospital and emerge in that courtyard. The staff processes the children, and you can hear Nadifa keep saying, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty. <laughs> Malaika is so weak, she doesn't even make a sound when an IV port is inserted into her hand. Once inside the hospital, Nadifa continues to croak that he's thirsty. First, they try to force him to drink easy-to-digest formula called F75. Then, a nurse props him on his lap and hands him a cup. Gulps it down, then he's handed another. Drinks that one down, too. The boy's mouth is framed in a milk mustache, and for the first time in a long time, his mother smiles. Our thanks to Matt for that. And still to come, confronting just how much climate change has transformed our world. Junior Z tells us how she's taking an in-depth look at what can be done in order to curb its impact. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 7 there for you with one touch the abc news app download it now this is abc news live prime thanks so much for streaming with us live reporting breaking news exclusives award-winning powerful eye-opening abc news live prime with lindsey davis streaming weeknights ready for a little gma -ish promo okay here we go gma 7a every day with robin george and michael that's how you start the day boom America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. As America and the world continue to confront the effects of human-induced climate change, one key way to help curb emissions may be to shift to an all-electric future. A new ABC News Live special, Lit, America's Future, from ABC's chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, looks at just that. Let's take a sneak peek. Deep inside a remote Idaho mountain, at the far reaches of muddy, dank, dark tunnels. What are we looking for? You'll find a key to our clean energy future. We came here for the cobalt. cobalt in these hills. Yeah. A race to power our planet. We have to go back to a practice that's thousands of years old and learn lessons from our past mistakes. We've had local populations of salmon go extinct from cobalt mining specifically. Not only seeing if we can mine enough of the key minerals we need. We still have an environmental obligation. But can we make batteries quick enough? And how will we recycle all of them? 
And have we been looking in the wrong place this whole time? Could the answer to powering everything up here be lying thousands of feet down there? Inside there is everything you need to build an electric vehicle battery. Nickel, copper, cobalt, and manganese. Is this the start of a new era or an environmental catastrophe? We hope that we should learn by now from our past mistakes. While there is no silver bullet to fix the rapid warming of our planet, there aren't any bullets without the critical minerals that will drive our future. What about the people saying, we don't need these? They're wrong. The frantic race for solutions so America's battery power future can stay lit. Really looks fascinating for more. Ginger Z joins us now in studio, Lit AF lit America's, America's future. future. Love that little <laughs> uh, play on words. Uh, so tell us why right now is such a critical time to really electrify America. I think this is the turning point. We're living it, which I find really exciting. I mean, can you imagine being alive when they realized we don't have to kill whales any mm. longer? And, but they, they had a whole industry based on that. And so it must have been scary when all the people with the horse and buggies were coming around and then there were Model Ts on the road. They must have been like, ooh, I don't know. There's not gas stations <laughs> everywhere. Like, like this is the evolution and that real turning point, and we get to be a part of it. So yes, I find it exciting after speaking to scientists from Princeton to all the people doing the mining that has done so much better today in this special. I am motivated, excited, and I hope people watching this special will feel educated and inspired to learn even more. Uh, here's a practical question, because I, I've heard people who are considering going, you just talked about the gas stations, yeah. and people were talking about, well, electric cars, there's the battery issue after mm. a decade. What happens with that? They're just going to be piling them up, you know, in a landfill. It, it, you say that's not true. No. Well, for one thing, I can tell you right now that the, the insides of those batteries are so valuable, nobody's going to be piling them up anywhere without wanting to recycle them. The process of recycling a lithium battery hasn't changed in about a century. There are two ways we do it, with acid or with fire. Now, at Princeton University and other places, they're finding new ways to make it way more cost effective. They cut the cost in half of recycling them. They're making it more water and energy efficient by 70 and 80% respectively. It is unbelievable what we're gonna be able to do and even mine in our drawers. I mean, think about at home, how many old phones, laptops, um, wires, that copper, the manganese, nickel, cobalt, that's all gotta go somewhere. And we can do that. There has to be policy probably, incentive as well. Uh, but then we've gotta also mine because there's no way that we're not going to need virgin material. And the question then becomes, can we do it here domestically? And can we then have our own future oil of these minerals? How are we gonna do it? And how are we gonna do it right this time? Well, I am certainly interested in planning on watching this mm. special, something that all of us can benefit and learn from. Your so. enthusiasm is, is contagious, Ginger. Great to have you in here, out of the rain and all the elements. <laughs> We're not used to seeing you I know. in a dry place. This is wonderful in here. <laughs> and to our viewers, you can catch Lit, America's Future, streaming tomorrow night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, after Prime, and on Hulu. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news, ABC.